Life as a form-changing robot is all about accepting the duality of your own existence, robot and truck. And that duality applies to things far beyond the realm of the tangible, good and evil, leader and follower. Like a robot and truck, it is possible for both failure and success to exist simultaneously in a single entity and for one to transform into the other. Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the history of The Transformers, the movie. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com is your source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, which, to be honest, is all things still pop culture now in the 2020s. We are in the future and we shaped it in our own image. 80s movies tees, 80s cartoon tees, video games, superheroes, music, wrestling, holidays. Honestly, it's not even limited to just the 80s. There's plenty of stuff from the 70s, the 90s, and the 2000s that you can wear in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. Heck, my dad is 71 and I got him this G.I. Joe bazooka jersey because he's a big New England Patriots fan. It's something we can enjoy together. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, from Bruce Lee to Napoleon Dynamite, shirts range from soft to, ooh, that's soft. Free worldwide shipping on orders $50 and up. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. The Transformers the Movie is an animated feature film released in 1986 based on the wildly popular toy line created by Hasbro two years earlier in 1984. It is also a turning point when Transformers fans and Hasbro executives got a painful lesson in the power and value of story-driven marketing. In the distant future of the year 2005, the Autobot Decepticon War is reaching a potential climax after millions of years of fighting. The Decepticons have the upper hand on Homeworld Cybertron, with the Autobots staging attacks from bases on two moons in orbit and, of course, across the stars on planet Earth, their adopted home since 1984. Nor since 4 million BC, but who's counting? Thanks to super spy Laserbeak, Megatron has learned that the Autobots are low on Energon. The Autobots are sending a ship to Earth to restock their supply before they can properly attack the Decepticons on Cybertron. But before that ship can make it to Earth, Megatron and his goons absolutely slaughter everyone on board. Brawn, Prowl, Ratchet, Ironhide, the Decepticons intend to keep the ship on track and fly right into the Autobot base on Earth and attack before the Autobots realize what happened. The Autobots are tipped off when two newcomers to the cast notice the hole in the side of the approaching craft, and the fight is on. Hot Rod, the stylish, young, impulsive space race car, and Spike Witwicky's son, who's named Daniel, absolutely thrilled kids sitting in the theater. I should know I was there. Thrilled beyond my, beyond our wildest dreams. A battle ensues that sees both sides take damage in ways that the daily cartoon had never depicted before. Young viewers experiencing trauma on top of trauma building up to the main event, Optimus Prime vs. Megatron. Ultimately, the Autobots prevail in the battle, staging a successful defense of the Earth base, but at a very high cost. The death of Optimus Prime at the hands of Megatron, which was, and still is, highly controversial. Nonetheless, just before he dies, Optimus passes the Autobot Matrix of Leadership to Ultra Magnus, whom he trusts to carry the burden of the fight for freedom throughout the galaxy, or to hand it off to the next most qualified Autobot. Megatron didn't do so well either. While he isn't killed in the fight, he's barely functioning and certainly in no position to enforce his authority within the Decepticons. On the trip back to Cybertron, his second-in-command, Starscream, takes over. Megatron and the handful of Decepticons, too wounded to resist, are cast out into space to fend for themselves surrendered to fate. Fate takes the form of an evil planet-sized monster transformer called Unicron, a godlike force and power and scale. He makes Megatron an offer he can't refuse. If Megatron agrees to find and destroy the Autobot Matrix of Leadership, the only thing that can kill Unicron, Unicron will give him the power and resources to accomplish the mission reborn as Galvatron. It's a race against time for the Autobots. They'll have to fight to survive long enough to learn the secrets of the Matrix of Leadership and the true nature of leadership itself. Who among them has the touch, the power to unlock the Matrix and light their darkest hour? And can they do it before Unicron and Galvatron destroy everything? 
The Transformers, the movie, was put into development during season one of the animated series in 1984 with a popular line of toys, a popular cartoon, and a popular comic book. The big screen was the next potential frontier for Hasbro, and one of the only large-scale marketing avenues left unexplored. Who conceived of the specific events depicted in the film, who gets credit for the specific ideas is a bit hazy, but we've done our best to try to clarify the general events these 35 years later. Because the whole thing, Transformers, is a cooperative process across a range of professional, financial, and creative disciplines, and people with different responsibilities. Because a movie based on a cartoon for a toy line isn't something that is produced by a single regular writer and a director alone. At the high level, you have executives at Hasbro and Takara, the two toy companies that produce the physical toys and own the intellectual property based on them. At the end of the day, their job is to sell as many toys to as many kids and make as much money as possible. At the medium level, you have Griffin Bacall Advertising, the marketing company that owned the production studio Sunbow Entertainment. Griffin Bacall and Sunbow worked for Hasbro with Marvel Productions to produce, among other things, cartoons like Transformers and G.I. Joe. At the lower level, you have the teams of writers, artists, and designers working on producing the various elements of the mythology at Hasbro or Marvel or Toei Animation, people who are earnestly trying to do their best but are limited by the decisions being made by the two higher levels of management. No one person person wrote this movie, no one person created any of the characters or events depicted, concepts were introduced and or mandated at different levels of the production process by different entities with different interests. That said, Ron Friedman is credited as the writer and claims he is the only person who worked on the only two versions of the finished script. Nelson Shin is credited as the director, and eight different people are listed as various kinds of producers. According to Flint Dilly, an associate producer, script supervisor, and sometimes writer for the regular series, a story consultant for the movie, the first draft was done by Ron Friedman. Ron Friedman had television credits going back to the 1960s. He wrote the five-episode miniseries that launched the G.I. Joe cartoon and was working on the G.I. Joe movie that was in production at the same time as Transformers. Why Ron Friedman? According to Dilly, Friedman had a really good agent who ensured that if movies were ever developed from properties like G.I. Joe and Transformers, Ron Friedman would be the one to write it. Also, according to Dilly, the first draft that Friedman turned in had pretty much everything in it that everyone at every level of management wanted in it. It was too much. Dilly has explained that, given the constraints Friedman had to work under, that script was, understandably, an incohesive collection of ideas and beats that weren't a proper screenplay. Once submitted, Dilly and producer Jay Bacall of Griffin Bacall spent a week reworking Friedman's script because it wasn't shootable. At the end of that week, Dillian Bacall turned in a script for a movie called The Secrets of Cybertron. In this version of the film, Optimus Prime would have traveled to the heart of Cybertron to learn the origins of the Transformers themselves. He would discover that Cybertron itself was a Transformer and Optimus would activate it with the Matrix. This would lead to a final climactic battle pitting Cybertron against the evil planet-sized Transformer Unicron. Dillian Bacall thought their revised script was... pretty good. But the Hasbro and Griffin Bacall executives thought it was... Not what they asked for. There are concepts in that script that would resurface in the regular series after the release of the movie, but the script itself is lost to time and non-disclosure agreements, and seem to be unrelated to the final second draft turned in by Ron Friedman. What Hasbro wanted was simple, a mechanism to turn over the roster of the existing toy line to reinvigorate sales for the year ahead. After two years, it was time to move on to new characters and, more importantly, new toys with new gimmicks to keep the system churning along. Transformers the cartoon was just a commercial to sell the toys. The movie wasn't intended to function any differently as far as they were concerned. The old toys are dead now, here are the new toys. The machine must be fed, all hail the machine. What the executives wanted, the executives got, and that was the script that was written by Ron Friedman. Despite the protests of the writers, the director, and the creatives who understood the relationships and significance of the characters to the audience, Optimus Prime had to die. Also, as many other characters as possible. A shrewd business move, a potentially catastrophic marketing move. There was no choice but to execute. Ron Friedman fought hard, strongly recommending against killing off Optimus specifically. He knew death was not an element that the kids who were watching the show and buying the toys were used to nor expecting within the established parameters of the series. Furthermore, he knew that the characters had been deliberately developed with specific archetypes that children would instinctively connect with. It had been a very smart and very lucrative marketing strategy. As Friedman put it, 
To remove Optimus Prime, to physically remove Daddy from the family, that wasn't going to work. I told Hasbro and their lieutenants they would have to bring him back, but they said no and had great things planned. In other words, they were going to create new, more expensive toys. They didn't recognize that Optimus Prime was the heartbeat of the Autobots, the strong and fatherly presence that made sure everybody else behaves and tries to live up to his example. You cannot pass that over and have any hope of duplicating the success you had. Friedman had no choice but to work within the limits assigned to him. At the end of the day, that was his job as he understood it as the writer. Optimus Prime had to go. But if he had to go, he was going to do it in a way that would allow the essence of Optimus Prime to transcend his death. That transcendental essence was what evolved into the matrix of leadership. Yes, the physical form of Optimus would be lost, but the values that informed his characters that made him who he was would be manifested in his true successor as chosen by the matrix itself, Hot Rod, who would become Rodimus Prime. And more Autobots join Optimus Prime. Cup reminds me of the battle on Beta 4. Hot Rod. Watch my smoke. Blur. They see me. NATO. And these are the new Decepticons, the evil Cyclonus. I'm spying for a fight. And Scourge. No one escapes the sweet. But soon a new Autobot leader will arrive. Introducing Rodimus Prime. No one can take on the Decepticons like Rodimus Prime. The Transformers. The Transformers. Each sold separately from Hasbro. The Transformers, the movie, had a $6 million budget, essentially six times as much as the cartoon series for the same amount of animation time, but piled on top of all the previously existing animation expectations Toei Animation was already working with. Which included, but was not limited to, animation for the Transformers TV series and for the G.I. Joe TV series and movie, a movie that was intended to be released prior to Transformers. G.I. Joe was the bigger name and had been around longer. Both films had the same goal, refresh the toy line by killing off Dad for the Joes, that put a bullseye on Duke. To make the leap to the big screen, Transformers was going to need to inject some star power. No offense to Peter Optimus Prime Cullen and Frank Megatron Welker, but their names weren't going to put a lot of butts in seats. Even Casey Kasem and Scatman Crothers wouldn't draw on their names alone. For the movie, an all-star cast was assembled, which should have been a big red flag to kids as soon as they sat down in the theater that something was up. Credits with big-name actors as characters they had never heard of before were dominating the screen as the theme song played. Eric Idle as Rekgar, Judd Nelson as Hot Rod, Leonard Nimoy as Galvatron. I never heard of most of them. Robert Stack as Ultra Magnus, Lionel Stander as Cup, Orson Welles as Unicron. Who are these fucking guys? The Transformers, the movie, was the final feature film performance for both Scatman Crothers and Orson Welles. Welles passed away about a month after recording his lines for the film. He is famously quoted as proudly proclaiming to his biographer, Barbara Leeming, You know what I did this morning? I played the voice of a toy. I play a planet. I menace somebody called something or other. Then I'm destroyed. My plan to destroy whomever it is is thwarted, and I tear myself apart on the screen. The Transformers the movie had an original score and songs composed by Vince DiCola, fresh off his hit score for the 1985 movie Rocky IV. It was a challenge as most of his music was developed using only storyboards for the film. It wasn't until the film was finished that he could go in and properly marry the music to the emotional beats. You got the touch. You got the power. The soundtrack also features Dare to be Stupid by Weird Al Yankovic and two songs sung by Stan Bush, Dare and The Touch, which was originally offered to Sylvester Stallone's movie Cobra. Lion brought an epic version of the Transformers theme as well. Two songs, Nothing's Gonna Stand in Our Way and Hunger, are credited to a band called Spectre General, even though that wasn't the name of the band. The name Kick Axe was changed without the permission of the band for concerns that Kick Axe wasn't appropriate for a kid's movie and ultimate release on cassette and CD. The Transformers the movie was released on August 8th, 1986 in the United States. It made $1.7 million in its opening weekend, which put it right behind About Last Night in 14th place. About Last Night, a film starring Demi Moore and Rob Lowe based on the 1974 day David Mamet play called Sexual Perversity in Chicago that had already been in theaters for five weeks. The Transformers, the movie, would scrape together a total of just under $6 million, which, if my math is correct, is just under the $6 million budget for the film. Is that right? It is currently in 110th place for 1986, right behind Highlander and another Hasbro film, My Little Pony, the movie. Look, 
I don't know much about the movie industry, but I know that it was a crowded field at the cinema that year. One of the biggest years on record churning out pop culture icon after pop culture icon, the previously mentioned About Last Night and My Little Pony the movie, of course. Short Circuit, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Labyrinth, Big Trouble in Little China, The Karate Kid Part 2, Aliens, Howard the Duck, Stand By Me, Flight of the Navigator, Crocodile Dundee, Space Camp, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, The Golden Child, Money Pit, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, Iron Eagle, Three Amigos and the number one hit film of the summer, Top Gun. Add to that, Transformers was distributed by the very young De Laurentiis Entertainment Group. Transformers was only their fourth film. I have no idea what they do or how they could be responsible for the poor performance of the film, but De Laurentiis handled both My Little Pony and Transformers, and that cost Hasbro nearly $10 million in lost sales. One year later, De Laurentiis was already $17 million in debt based on their run of box office flops. You know, they have a saying in Chicago, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, the third time it's enemy action. Transformers was targeted at kids and young teens. This was reinforced by the PG rating, which was done intentionally to sell more tickets because PG movies got more showings than G-rated movies. A G rating means all ages, saccharine stuff. PG means you're going to get some intense robot fighting action, and in this case, Spike Witwicky is gonna say, Oh shit! What and make a bunch of 10 year olds wonder if that meant they were allowed to use that word now that the robot toy cartoon established precedent. The movie was designed from the beginning to sell more toys. Out with the old, in with the new. The toys released before the movie were still on the shelves when the movie came out. The difference with these characters and these toys is the shift from reliance on previously existing molds that had been a part of existing Japanese toy lines. Ultra Magnus notwithstanding. Optimus, Ironhide, Prowl, Windcharger, all the dead Autobots, Megatron, Skywarp, Kickback, Bombshell, all the reformatted Decepticons. Kids would likely have already owned these when they walked into the theater. The hope was that they would run out and buy the newly introduced Hot Rod, Cup, Galvatron, Blur, and Rodimus Prime. Conspicuously absent from the roster of movie-related toys were the single prominent female character created for the movie, R.C., and the big bad guy himself, Unicron. Both were prototyped, but neither were ever released due to either production costs or assumptions that they would not sell well enough. Marvel Comics had been producing a Transformers comic as long as the cartoon had been airing on television. Like the toys, the existing comics were available when the movie was released. The monthly series continued despite it evolving with a different storyline than the television series. A movie-specific adaptation was published in 1986 based on an earlier version of the script and therefore has some slightly different story elements. A storybook adaptation was also published and released in the UK by Lady Bird Books. Years later, in 2006, IDW published a four-issue adaptation of the movie to celebrate the 20th anniversary. Like toys and comics, any Transformers merchandise that was already on the shelves was given a boost by the release of the film. Costumes, party supplies, coloring books, clothing, sheets, very little merchandise with the movie branding was released. East. However, there were official posters and a sticker book by Diamond. The Transformers the movie was released on VHS and Beta in 1987 by Family Home Entertainment. It was the first time that fans got to see the entire picture because the movie, while being projected in theaters as if it were widescreen, was actually cropped at the top and bottom to make it look widescreen. The full picture, as animated, wasn't visible until it was released on home media. That wasn't the only change. Spike's aw shit was cut from the home releases. Another move intended to drive sales as much as possible, and it worked. The Transformers the movie was a top 25 performer for 40 weeks after its release in 1987. Over the years, it's been released on Blu-ray, DVD, and 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray by Shout Factory. You can purchase or rent it online streaming at most of the prominent streaming services, Amazon, YouTube, Apple TV, Google Play. The 1987 UK home media VHS and beta releases had an additional opening crawl text clarifying some of the setup as well as a closing narration that reassured Optimus Prime will return. An attempt to assuage the concerns of fans who did not react well to Optimus Prime's death, the first attempt by Hasbro to do some damage control after things went sideways on them. The Transformers the movie was, at the time of its release, a box office bomb. I know this word gets used a lot in clickbait YouTube video titles, but it was a failure. It didn't even make back its $6 million production budget or the additional marketing budget that goes along with it. It was either derided by critics or simply not worth commenting on. Leonard Malton gave it one and a half stars out of four, calling it a feature-length toy commercial. The fallout from the story of the film, an admitted attempt at marketing more toys to kids, the decision to kill Optimus was nearly fatal to the brand itself. Flint Dilly said, quote, We didn't know that he was an icon. It was a toy show. We just thought we were killing off the old product line to replace it with new products. Kids were crying in the theaters. We heard about people leaving the movie. We were getting a lot of nasty notes about it. 
Kids weren't heading back to the theater for multiple viewings to relive the trauma, the tragedy of losing their favorite characters combined with the introduction of characters that they had no connection to before they had a chance to deal with the loss pushed many kids away. To this day, some fans hold a grudge against Hot Rod for not getting out of the way. It was, it was Prime's fight. The reception to the film, to the death of Optimus Prime, was so negative that it killed any further efforts Hasbro had planned for theatrical releases of films based on their products. G.I. Joe not only skipped theaters going straight to television and home video, but changed their story as well to avoid the same backlash that Transformers had received. Duke was supposed to die when Serpentor threw a snake through his heart. The movie was designed to refresh the toy line just like the Transformers. Optimus Prime's death saved Duke, putting him in a snake-induced coma instead of taking his life. Not to mention that the instant the negative feedback started coming in, Hasbro immediately put a plan into motion to get Optimus back on his feet, leading the Autobots into battle. Not only would he be back to save the day in Season 3, but in the end, he would save the entire universe. Hang on, Autobots, it's not over. Optimus Prime returns February 24th and 25th on The Transformers. See The Transformers weekday mornings at 8 on TV5. The Transformers, the movie, in the short term, failed. But time would tell a different story. The generation that grew up with the characters would come to embrace the movie as a turning point in their love of the franchise. Through multiple home releases and Optimus Prime's return to prominence within the mythology and successive cartoons, comics, and other media, the movie could retroactively be appreciated for the dramatic narrative that the writers intended it to have. It was special to be able to see who would take on the mantle of Prime after Optimus was gone. Hot Rod could be appreciated as the leader he came to be in Rodimus. The movie could have been the end of the brand, but history shows that the toy line would continue through 1993 before a brief period of repaints and then giving away to Beast Wars in 1996. Today, 35 years since the release of the movie, Transformers is doing fine. Last year alone, 68 different Optimus Prime figures were released. Is that right? We are taking the children. The 2007 live action film Transformers accomplished the feat of bringing the franchise to movie theaters in a way that the producers of the 1986 movie could not have imagined with realism and real profits. Incorporating some elements introduced in the 1986 movie, driving the brand for the next decade and itself getting rebooted in the process to power on into the future with 2018's Bumblebee movie and a sequel planned for 2022. You got the touch. You got the power. Generation 1 still dominates the Transformers landscape. Stan Bush's The Touch found its way into Transformers games and movie soundtracks. He and Vince DiCola have performed their songs at conventions all over the world. A tribute band called Cybertronic Spree has made a name for themselves wearing costumes featuring main characters from the movie while performing songs from the soundtrack. Super 7 released figures for the 35th anniversary, and of course Hasbro has gone back to the well time and time again, with figures for everyone from Cup to Blur to RC to Rekgar, Sharktacons, and Quintessons, most recently in their studio series line with some of the best, most accurate representations of the movie characters ever produced. In 2019, Hasbro ran a crowdfunding program to finally give Unicron his due. A massive transforming figure was realized on the strength of over 10,000 backers, contributing at least $575 a piece. That's just under $6 million, which, if my math is correct, is just under the production budget to make the movie in the first place. Is that right? It's like poetry. It rhymes. 35 years later, the Transformers the movie still has the touch, still has the power. It's returning to theaters this year in 2021 to mark the 35th anniversary. Fans and Hasbro marketing executives learned a lot, and those lessons are still with us today because... You know, sometimes when your hopes have all been shattered, there's nowhere to turn. You wonder how you keep going. Instead, think of all the things that really matter and the chances you've earned. The fire in your heart is growing. You can fly if you try, leaving the past behind. Heaven only knows what you might find. Probably more Transformers. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started streaming on Twitch. Find us at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon or become a YouTube channel member. Thanks again to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. You can order this shirt today if you want. Not this one. This one's mine. Let us know in the comments down below if you have any unique experiences related to The Transformers, the movie. For me, it would be watching cartoons the week before the premiere and the station was running a contest where 
each day they revealed the next letter of the name of one of the new characters in the movie, you had to mail in your guess on a note card. They got as far as U-N-I-C blank blank N, and everyone just assumed the new character's name was Unicorn, because what else could it possibly be? <laughs> we were wrong. I can admit that now. Cut.